Well, I'm fully convinced, and I know I'm not the only one, that I'm convinced that if we would actually do what we heard just now, that not only would all of the needs of the church be covered, but we would enjoy the abundance to be able to reach out more aggressively. Okay, I believe that. Because God is a giver of good gifts. And everything that we have is from Him. The Bible even says that. What is it that we have that we have not received? Right? Everything. So whatever you just put in that basket, that wasn't yours anyway. Doesn't it feel good to get rid of it? Yeah, I'm for, I'm for real. I'm not joking around. I'm for real. My, my, my wife and I, we, we, had some, we had some money we were going to give. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Like, it was, it was at the house. And I was like, honey, we got to get that over to the church. I got to get it out of my hand. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm holding on to something that's not mine. It's kind of stealing, you know. I didn't, I mean, I'm just being honest with you, transparent. I, I didn't like having it in my hand. That was God's money. And I need to get it out of my house quickly. I don't want to be no aching. You know what I'm saying? If y'all of you know. So, but God is a giver of good gifts. And uh, so I just want, I, I want to share something with you. Um, the Bible, which we, we cherish here and we study every single week, it's the center of what we do. Um, the, in the Bible, it says that Jesus Christ gave gifts to the church. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And um, so, you know, it's not just that he gives us a music stand or stuff, chairs and, and all that, or some money. It, it's not that. A lot, most often it's people. And, and so God, God has been super, super faithful uh, in, in that area. And so tonight I just really want to, I want to make a, a really special now, an announcement to me that really is so massively huge. I I hope that you guys understand how big this is. For years and years, I have prayed. And I have prayed for a specific person to, to come and to partner with me. God, send the godly man. Send the godly man who can be here and help hold my arms up and, and, and love the people. And, and so uh, a lot of us pray and we don't get our answer right away. You know, and we start complaining to God, don't look at me like I'm the only one. You guys do it too. Uh, sometimes God takes a little time to answer a prayer because he wants it to be just right, and he wants us to know that it's just him. And so I think that's exactly what's happened here. I have prayed to the Lord of the harvest to send the workers because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And uh, so I prayed for, for a specific person. Because the Bible tells us that I'm to care for the flock God's entrusted to me. And so as this flock continues to grow, and for those of you that have been a part of this church for any time, you, you know just sitting here, it's growing. It's growing. And so I can't, I can't love you uh, the way I need to love you. I can't spend the time with you that, that I, that I want, would want to. I just can't. You know, if, if the church continues to grow, you need to have other people here at the church to share the load, to, to be in communication often with the people and praying for them and spending time with them and visiting them and, and teaching them and preaching God's word to them and all these different things that I just can't do on my own. But, but I love you and, and I want to see you shepherded well. And so we need godly men to come alongside and help. Amen. And so tonight, I just want to introduce you to this, to this man. This is the answer to our prayer. Many of us, um, he has the full support and blessing of all three elders here at the church, myself, Dan Johnson, and Robert Bidding. Uh, we love him. We respect him. We're excited that he's here at our church. And so I just want to introduce to you our new associate pastor, Tom Simpson. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself and his wife, Felicia, uh, for a few moments. But before he does that, um, I just want to say it's a joy and a privilege to have you here. Um, certainly could be my pastor. Kind of freaks me out a little bit, but I'm going to do the best I can with it. He comes with a, an amazing uh, wealth of knowledge and wisdom in the scriptures. Um, he's, a, he's a leader. Uh, outside of this place here, he teaches, for a living, he teaches character development. And, and, and I, I just, I'm, a, I'm the person that thinks, hey, 
yeah, we need theology, but before we have more theology, we need a little character, right? To, to kind of do what it already says to do and that we know to do, and we lack that. So that's what he does for a living, a guy who teaches character. Yeah. So him and his wife, um, you've been together, what, 142 years? Yes. We're yes. Working on 150, I think. 150. <laughs> um, he's going to tell you about his family and, and all and the adventure that they've been on for many, many years. But I know that he uh, was a pastor at a church in Hilton Head for over 20. He was out in the mission field in Africa for a couple of years. They were uh, been involved in some church planting. He's a certified life coach with the John Maxwell Leadership uh, Group. So he just has a lot of experience, a lot of uh, wisdom, and he has decided that this is where God has placed him and to use those Amen. gifts and his knowledge to share and shepherd with you. So Amen. welcome, Tom. Okay. Well, let me tell you about the Simpsons. Wait a minute. Not those Simpsons. Uh, my family. Uh, Felicia and I, believe it or not, have not been married 142 years, and it's 35. We have two children. Keely and Billy, and um, both of them are married. Keely is married to Chris. Chris is, um, plays in a praise band up in Columbia, South Carolina. He's also in construction. And Keely is a stay-at-home mom, homeschooling four children. And Eli, Levi, and Makai are the three little blonde boys, and uh, Mia, and they adopted Mia from Ethiopia, and she's been with us for just over a couple years, and uh, just a real blessing to the family. Our son is a uh, college tennis coach up at Coker College up in South Carolina. His wife is a school teacher, and they just had their first little one, and his name is Mickey. And so uh, that kind of introduces you to the Simpsons. We've, uh, as Moses said, the Lord's given us a lot of adventures. When we got married and at the wedding, my mom uh, told Felicia that if, uh, and if you ever thought that you were going to get bored, it's not going to be with Tom. And so every year since then, our anniversary in the card, are you bored yet? And she hasn't had to say yes yet. And we keep, and God keeps moving us in uh, many different ways and using us in around the world, really. Uh, as Pastor Moses shared, we ended up, had been a part of a church on Hilton Head and helped them plant a church on the mainland side in Bluffton, South Carolina. Also helped plant a church when we, uh, when I taught at a at Coker College, I taught world religions there, and I also was the uh, tennis coach. By trade, I was a tennis player, and uh, we went to Hilton Head Island unsaved, and for two years, two tennis pros worked on us and continued to, they never gave up, they continued to share the love of Christ with us. And those two guys, uh, I just praise God for them. Uh, then after uh, praying to receive Christ, I was at a huddle house on Hilton Head about 5.30 in the morning, and a man walked in. I had my Bible open, and he said, that's a pretty good book that you're reading. And I said, it's the best. He introduced me, and he was a pastor on Hilton Head, and he ended up discipled me for two years. And uh, the elders there then sent me off to Bible college. And so it's been an adventure. It has been an adventure. We went to South Africa, taught at a Bible college in South Africa. We were in South Africa the year Mandela was elected president. And to just a little bit after that, we got to live in a thatch roof and hut that did not have electricity or running water uh, when we first got there. We went 40 some days without electricity and I don't know, 60 some days without water during the first year. And that became an, ad an adventure. I got to ask you, how many of you have prayed when you opened uh, up the, the faucet, when you turned on the faucet, and actually prayed for water to come out? We became thankful for every little blessing, which, as Moses again said, and uh, they all come from the Lord. 
And we didn't realize as Americans that how much of a blessing water is. Right. Flipping the switch and actually having electricity. Yeah. The first day that we were in South Africa, we went to the grocery store like you should, came out with our green jug of milk. When I poured it, it was like liquid cottage cheese and because they had a freezer section, but electricity wasn't in the village yet. And so who knows how long it was there, but it was chunky. And so uh, we learned to do other things rather than in shop at that store. But <laughs> no, you never knew that Publix was a blessing. You needed to realize that. Uh, but as in we're just so thankful for this church when we first started coming in the fall there was maybe 15 20 people here on a sunday evening on a saturday evening uh and when we came on sunday morning there was three of us in felicia myself and one other individual and moses and to see what's happening here is is a god thing and one of the things i always talk about is look to see where god's fingerprints are Every day, try to find his fingerprints on a part of your, uh, on a part of what you experience. And this is one where we're not only seeing fingerprints, we're seeing palm prints, we're seeing his arms wrapped around this place. And so we're, we're very excited about being here. Moses, probably three, four weeks ago, asked me to be uh, praying about what I would want to share. Share your heart, Tom, with the, the congregation. Two weeks ago, I believe, on the Sunday, uh, on Saturday uh, night, he ended up, challenged everybody that we we're going to do church a little bit different on that Sunday and morning and that Saturday night was we were actually going to pray we broke off into small groups. How many of you were here when we got great? We actually broke into small little groups of three and we started praying. He guided us and where I went to seminary, they used to call those concerts of prayer. Somebody would guide you in a direction, but then would leave it up to you and the Holy Spirit in your little group to pray whatever was on your heart on that topic. The very last topic that he talked about was what is your dream? What is your, you know, what is the Lord putting on your heart for this congregation, mm -hmm. for this church, for revolution? And as I continued to pray about what I was going to teach on, my, my heartbeat for the church is kept coming up. And I wanted to just share that with you. And what a church, what scripture says a church should be. And I'm going to talk to you about three questions that the Lord put on my heart. And it all meshes together. What does God desire from all Christians? What is a healthy church? What makes a church a dynamic witness in the world? One other thing I need to let you know. When you hear Moses, Moses is a preacher. He is a preacher. There is, hands down, God has blessed him as a preacher. Fire, it comes out. And yeah, I mean, he's, he's a stomper, he's a preacher, and everybody. That is one of the reasons why we came. But I gotta let you know, I found out in Africa, Pastor Masangani, in Gigi Mundani, a small little village church, he'd have me come and speak to the congregation. And the second or third time and that we were there, he introduced me as, everyone, this is Tom. Tom is not our preacher. <laughs> Tom is our teacher. And so I am a teacher. Okay, so bear with the different style change, but there's, and one of the things that I've also learned is um, there's different methods, and as long as the principles are what we stand on, God's word, the methods may be a little different, but the heartbeat is the same. And so, um, so what does God desire from all believers? 
If you've got your Bibles with you, and hopefully you do, and if you don't, we provide them. They're on the tables at the pews. Go ahead and open up to Mark 12. We're going to be in verses 29 to 32. Are we there? Okay. Starting in verse 29, Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The, in that, first what God's asking is a relationship with him. The second part of that is he wants us to have a relationship with others. It starts vertical. What do we study on, uh, what book do we study on Wednesday? Vertical, okay? It it's all starts upward. Our relationship to God. It's kind of an upward, downward. As we worship him, he fills us, which comes first. It goes either way. It's an upward, inward, and then naturally, as Jesus is telling us here in Mark, it should flow outward. It's got to go upward. It's our worship. It's our praise. It's our study. It's our listening to him. It's the downward. It's the filling. It's the growing. It's the renewing. It's getting rid of the baggage and filling us with his love. It's upward, inward, Outward. Good. To look at that at the very beginning. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Think about those words. Oftentimes we welcome God, but the word Lord, when we think we welcome Jesus, because he died for our sins. But it was great to hear Mike talk about he's our Lord, our only Lord. When you think about a Lord, that is your, your boss, common words. It's who you answer to. It's the one you, you live for and you act out his, his requirements, his calling for you. He's our God, only God, and our Lord, too often we try to separate. I'll take Jesus as my Savior. I'll take God as God the Creator. But I don't want to make Him our Lord. It's a total package, folks. It's, it's a total lifestyle. He goes so far as your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. I don't think he left anything out. He wants all of you. Okay. Second part is the relationship of loving your neighbor as yourself. How do you love yourself? Y'all got clothes on. Good, good news there. With that, you care for yourself. Most of you have eaten sometime this week. You, many of you, even myself, I have two drinks over there and one up here. So we nourish ourselves. We take care in so many different ways. We love ourselves in our health, in our clothing, in our shelter, all those things. But we're supposed to even love our neighbor. And who's our neighbor? It's everybody. It's not just the person who has the address next to you, but it's everybody that you come in contact with. 
We're responsible for this generation of lost souls. We're responsible for this generation of souls, lost or saved. Let's go to John 13, just a couple pages further over. John 13, verse 34. Just as Moses says, there's no better sound on a Saturday night than to hear the pages turning. Amen. Getting you in the word of God. John 13, 34. Are we, we're still turning. Take your time and find it. So we just talked about. That God wants a relationship with us, and God wants us to have a relationship with others. John 13 tells us that God is relational, and he wants us, and he's made us to be relational also. John 13, 34 says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. God's relational. He loves us. Let me tell you how unique that is. I taught world religions for four years at, at a university. All the other religions, that is something that is void. Second largest religion in the world God is so distant, the God that they worship is so distant, people can never reach him. Another religion that's the third largest ends up, has so many gods that they are constantly trying to please each of them, that they can't get it right the first time, they have to come back and come back and come back and they still can't get it right. We have a God that not only that wants to be our God, but he calls himself our father. Yes. Okay. Only religion that has God telling us that he is our father. All relationship there. The, not only is he relational, he wants us, and because of Christ in us, the Holy Spirit flowing through us, we can be relational. He tells us here, we're supposed to love. We have to love each other. And that love is unique because that is a God love. This is not just, I mean, and scripture talks about three or four different types of love. There's phileo, which is a brotherly love. That's where we get in the, the city of in Philadelphia comes from that. It's a brotherly love. It's when, hey, buddy, how you doing? That kind of love. There's an eros love, which is a sexual love. It's not talking that kind of love. This is a God love. This is agape love. Okay, this is one that loves unconditionally. This is who we're supposed to be as a church. And if we are that way, the world will know us as his disciples. That's so awesome. Let me just say, in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that we are the aroma of Christ. So my question is, how do you smell? Right, wait, would you turn to your neighbor and, and tell them, I smell you? Wait a minute. Go ahead. Turn to your neighbor, I smell you. Now, the question is, what do you smell? Hopefully you smell Jesus. Okay? We're not talking arid, or we're not talking men, in, or in, we're, we're not talking in one of those colognes or, or perfumes. You should smell Christ coming out of the person next to you as the body of Christ. Well, we are the reflectors of God's grace. We are the moon, He's the sun. We reflect His brightness. His light. That's who the church is. His desire, Kittles wrote this, his desire is for us to have a relationship with him. 
As that becomes a reality, it manifests itself through our relationships with others. Then in our relationships with others, people observing will know of our relationships with God. As Moses told you, I'm a bit of a bookworm. I study and read a whole bunch. Let me give you a little history. I know, some of you are going, <laughs> wait a minute, stay with me. This was written about the church 1,800 years ago by a non-Christian. In the second century, Aristides wrote, he's a secular philosopher. He provides the truest definition of what the church ought to be. And he's talking about the church in his town. They abstain from all impurity in the hope of the recompense that is to come in another world. As for their servants or handmaidens or children, they persuade them to become Christians by the love they have for them. And when they become so, they call them without distinction brothers. They do not worship strange gods. They walk all in humility, in kindness, and falsehood is not, fun, is not found among them. And they love one another. Remember, this is a secular philosopher, one of the Greek philosophers, talking about the Christian church, the early church. When they see a stranger, they bring him into their homes and rejoice over him as a true brother. For they do not call brothers those who are after the flesh, but those who are in the spirit and in God. And there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and if they have not abundance of necessity, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with the necessary food. They observe scrupulously the commandment of their Messiah. They live honestly and soberly as the Lord their God commanded them, every morning and all hours on account of the goodness of God towards them. They praise and laud him, and over their food and their drink, they render thanks to him. And if any righteous person of the number passes away from this world, they rejoice and give thanks to God. They follow his body as, through, as though they were moving from one place to another. And when a child is born, they praise God. And if again it chances to die in its infancy, they praise God mightily as the one who passed through the world without sin. This is the witness, the lifestyle was so obvious to the lost. This is an account of a lost philosopher looking and observing the Christian church. Can that be said about us? That's a challenge for each of us. So I ask, what do you smell like? Well, hopefully we got a tub over here. And <laughs> Moses, next time if there's bubbles in there, then I really know you've taken this a little bit far. Well, the next slide, the, just, if you, Moses alluded to this, Acts 1, 14, they all met together and they were constantly united in prayer along with Mary the mother of Jesus, and several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They met together. We're doing it. They were united, and they prayed. Those are all things that the church is supposed to be doing. It's what the church is supposed to be about. Just a little bit further over in chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, all believers were meeting together in one place. Here we are gathering together in one place, all of us. Acts uh, 42. 
All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Hopefully you're doing this. I haven't put you to sleep yet. So everybody, wake up. You, and so the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to, uh, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them. And the apostles performed many miracles and miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those that were being saved. Amen. So, God's relational. God wants us, uh, God wants a relationship with each one of us. And so it's not just a one-sided thing. It's not just God loving us, but he wants us to love him, and then he wants us to love others. New Testament model is for the church to meet together, to do it often, to fellowship That's what God wants from each and every one of us. The second question is, what makes a healthy church? Is it the size? Is it the building? Is it the programs? I don't know if you'll be able to read that. But one of the things that's interesting is as, um, as Christians, we are supposed to be timely. We have to live in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. But sometimes when we look at what the world has to say, it can be an interesting comment on us as Christians. Doonesbury here. There was a whole series, and this is one of the last ones. He's his friend ended up started a church, and he's totally shocked about the, his friends and starting a church. So how did you do it? Well, I had a search group. We did all these and research about this and that and the other. And so he's going through all these different sequences. It was actually a whole week, and it comes down to this. It's an interesting congregation, Mike. Members are far more consumer conscious than they used to be. The church has, has to deliver for its members. Counseling, uh, uh, social events, recovery programs, tutoring, fitness center. We have it all to offer. So where does God fit into all this? God? Well, God's still the, the draw for sure. He's got the big name. But do you ever evoke it anymore. Um, frankly, Mike, God comes with, uh, with a whole lot of baggage. The whole male Eurocentric guilt thing. Well, I'm afraid the way the world sees the church is as a whole in the West, we have become a social club. Many churches offer aerobics, Yoga, hot yoga, we have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's all program centered. But where's the ministry and where's God? One of the things that really drew Felicia and I here was the preaching that was going on. Moses, week in, week out, always took us back to scripture to what God wants us to do, how God wants to grow us, what is important in God's economy. It's important to, to realize what the church and the Bible is supposed to be about. If you would, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4.
Ephesians 4, verses 11, maybe through 16. Well, for sure, 11 through 13. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Let me point out, as I did here on the slide, what the church is supposed to be about. Scripture tells us that the leaders are to equip. So the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists, they are to equip the body. But it doesn't stop there. It's not a Saturday night thing. It's not an occasional Wednesday thing. And if you're not too busy, it's not a Monday night thing. This is supposed to be leaders equipped but the equip, then serve. We're looking for servants. Moses talked about the fields are white. We're looking for and people to be part of the, the, the harvest, to harvest the field. But, so the leaders equip, the equip, serve. The Living Translation says work. And then the workers are to do what? They're to build up the church. Everybody has a role. The opening video that was shown tonight. He talked about the body of Christ. The word soma is used 30 times in the New Testament to talk about the church. The church is a body. Christ is the head. The church is the body. Now, if you look at your body, you got a lot of parts. A body functions when all the parts are working. Can a body function without all the parts? Yeah, hey, and I'm totally deaf in my left ear. Been that way since I was seven years old. I've already had 19 ear surgeries trying to restore the hearing. We finally gave up. I wasn't supposed to happen. Good news is it happened so early in my life that my right ear, up until I found music and and the volume i guess music is good it's the volume that i cranked it at my good ear was at one time 120 percent how that works i have no idea of what a normal ear is supposed to be able to hear my body compensated and i'm afraid when the church y'all me when we don't function and give our gifts and talents back to the body, sometimes the body will make up for it. Other times, it'll just be a void. God can do all things. He's allowed this year to be pretty good. But we need you. We need each one of you. Everybody that's saved has at least one spiritual gift. The body functions so much better when it has all of its parts. So, talks about synergy. And, and just, I mean, one of, if you want to look and do a personal study on the body, 1 Corinthians uses 14 times the word body, talking about the body of Christ, the church. That's you guys. It functions because you guys are here, not just in attendance, but you are members to one another. Let me just, do you see the hearts of the, the leaders? One of the things that drew us here, the hearts of the leaders of revolution, preaching the word on Saturday night and Sunday morning. The whole idea is try to get a picture of who Jesus is and what he and has told his people. We're in the book of Mark and we're going to be there for a long time. 
I preached the book of Galatians, and it took me 14 months, and it's only a few chapters long. And, and it's one of those, to dig in to the word. I love that. That's why we're here. Second part, worship and praise. The songs of worship to the Father. It's not just Christian feel-good songs. We're worshiping. Okay? How about prayer? So neglected in so many different places. It is a heartbeat of revolution. It is an evening at revolution. What's happening because of that? You get to, first of all, do you know that every major movement of the Holy Spirit started with a small group of people praying? Every great revival in history can be pointed back to a small group of people praying. There's a famous I mean, movement called the Haystack Movement. A couple, three ladies praying. Billy Graham had two ladies always praying for him. It's amazing to see what happens when God's people get down on their knees and pray to him for his strength, his guidance, his wisdom. Well, midweek vertical. We're looking upward through to the Lord. Because of looking upward, he's feeling us inward. And what we're starting to see is people are now reaching outward. We've had our missionaries here two or three times in the few months that I've been here and speaking to you how you're outward and, uh, and that's going to the ends of the earth. But it's not just there, but it's in our Jerusalem, which is our area, to the Judea and Samaria, which is closer, but not quite to the ends of the earth. And then it's to the ends of the earth is where our missionaries are. We're having an impact. That's what it's all about. We're also, it doesn't stop there. It's exciting to see people are doing one-on-one -on -one ministry with one another. Remember, I'm talking about my heartbeat here, but I'm seeing it lived out at Revolution. I was sitting in that chair for the last seven, eight months just seeing what God's going to be doing here. And it's been exciting. Larry Crabb, Christian author and pastor, uh, Christian psychologist, talks about bringing his mother down, and they were looking for um, a nursing home. He went to one nursing home, and there were three rows of rocking chairs, about 10 to 15 long, and they were all rocking. And the person that wasn't in the front row got to see the person in front of their head. The people in the third row got to see the person in front of the, the second row's heads. And I know this is true for, for Moses. He's shocked that we actually have pews here at Revolution. <laughs> but one of the problems is you're not supposed to just see the person in front of you, the back of their head. It's about relationship. So it's uh, dependent upon each one here to have a relationship within the body of Christ here for us to function. Sometimes that... And, and I know we try with our three minutes of saying hello to one another. Those are nice, but you don't get past a whole lot of hello, my name is, and that's about where it ends. That can be a name to a face, but it's what you do after the name. Are you coming alongside? Are you praying with them? Are you fellowshipping with them? Are you doing anything else besides getting a name, and then looking at the back of their head. It should be face to face. It should be lived out. One of the, the ways that the, the world makes fun of the body of Christ is it says the church is irrelevant, but they steal from what we're supposed to be doing. 
think about it. Who do you see and when do you see hands go up, voices screaming out, praising? Football games, baseball games, basketball games, concerts. A whole lot of praising going on, but it's just not in the churches. There's another place. And I want you to just, some of you may be old enough to remember this, but the next slide. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Okay, some of you remember it. Cheers. Let me just go through the words again for you, and you can follow along, and I'm not going to sing. Hallelujah. Okay. Remember, I'm the only person that makes Bob Dylan sound like he's a great singer, okay? So... I can lip sync in that front row seat very well. Okay, making your way through the world takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, where they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see your troubles and our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. You want to go where people know people are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. Think about that as a church. Should that not be what the body is about? Yes. Where people know one another, where people care for one another. I was blessed today because one of our church members when I asked him before the even little meet and greet, I asked him how he's doing, and he shared with me. Really, he didn't just give me the old, ah, I'm fine. He went ahead and said straight up that he wanted prayer. He, wanted, he was struggling. And wow, that was a major, and a, a, a major and attaboy from the Lord for what I'm preaching on. Yes. That is what we should feel comfortable enough with that we can share our problems and know that the other guy's not any better than, than me, but he cares. Yes. That makes it unique. Yes. Well, what makes a dynamic church? Acts 1, if you can go back a couple chapters. Acts 1, 8. This is something we forget that we have. <coughs> Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power. Okay, stop right there. That word power? Dynamis? We get the word, what do you think, comes from dynamis? Dynamite. dynamite, yes. We've got dynamite at our, wait, not just a stick. We got God's dynamite, God's power available to us. If you ever want to hear about God's dynamite, ask Moses about this building. Who would have ever thought that we could be in this building? I still get a kick out of one paint company's guy donating another company's paint to make this place happen. Who are, that ain't of the world. Well, this should be very exciting for us because in the, I should probably finish. But you will, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about uh, me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth with God's power, that dynamite that's working in us. We're not a church without batteries. We're a church that has the ever-ready battery in us. We have dynamite. We have that power. 
if you're looking for a side study sometime, think about studying Christ in me. Then follow it up with me and Christ. That's an incredible study. With the power of the Holy Spirit, why we walk and live and do the dailies in the Spirit, Paul introduces a new concept, and it's called Alion. Alion in the Greek is the one another's. And over a hundred times, you know, Moses has said this repeatedly, but if Christ said it, then we should do it. If it's in the book once, we should do it. A hundred times in the New Testament, the phrase alion, one another, that word, two words, one Greek word, one, two American words. So it's in scripture. One another. With that one another, what are some of the one another's that we're supposed to do? I have a handout if you want to find, find them out. Over a hundred times used. And in it is in over uh, 60 sometimes it's used in the positive. And, uh, and then in the negative it's used in about 32 times. There, there are some negative one another's. You should not bite one another. You should <laughs> not a physical bite. But have you ever been around people who talk about other people? Sometimes their words can be biting. We're not supposed to devour one another, taken to the next step. After a lot of biting, you just chew them up and spit them out. And that's how churches, and so often where it's said that the church is the only place that wounds their own, okay? And they kill their own. We can't do that, body. We're told that we're so many positive one another's that we're supposed to do. The turn last few for me. Turn to Romans for me, chapter twelve. Out of the hundred one another's, eleven one another's are used in the last four chapters of Romans. 11 of them. First part of Romans is all the, about doctrine. The last part about Romans is all about the church. And you're going to see exactly what, what the Lord has in mind. Romans chapter 5. We are to be members of one another. We are many parts of of one body. We all belong to each other. In the, NIV, in the NIV, it tells us that we are to be members. In the New Living Translation here, it says that we are to belong to one another. Again, the concept of the body. There's an interdependence, a unity. Think about a recipe. If you're making cookies, and I make good cookies. Not only do I make them, I like to eat them. If I would make my chocolate chip cookies and without flour, <laughs> not good at all. But if I put the flour in, but I forget the chocolate chips, it'd be okay, but it wouldn't be a chocolate chip cookie. Right. You need all the ingredients. You need the body. Next, Romans 12.10, just a couple verses further down. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. In that, it's genuine infection means, uh, affection means devotion. And that concept of devotion is the concept of family. It's more than just devoted in the English. It's deeper than just a kind uh, devotion. And it's really talking about, in the Greek, about a, uh, a parent's love for a, and their child. How many of you have had kids? How many of you know your child's cry? I never knew you could know your own child's cry until I had a child. And I didn't for, personally have the child, but my wife had the child, but I participated. But you actually learn to hear. I, mean, I thought all cries were the same. 
but you actually know your own child's cry. Out of all the nurseries, you can hear that cry. And moms and dads hop up and go get the child. That's the kind of devotion that they're talking about. Brotherly love here. We talked about Philadelphia. This is a sibling love and special kind. And it's friendship, love, family love. Blood's thicker than water. We're to honor one another. It gives give preference to one another. And, it's, and to consider others better, more worthy than ourselves. It's true and humility. Did you know that St. Benedict's motto was receive all strangers as Christ. When we were driving back from, and driving up to Illinois when we were in seminary, we had a trip from uh, the Twilight Zone. We, we ended up uh, driving back. We got to Indianapolis and the car broke down. We ended up putting in a new alternator we get to London, Kentucky, just outside of London, Kentucky, and the car breaks down a second time during a snowstorm. At the snowstorm, and we have now tapped out. This is before, and we had credit cards. We had a checkbook, and we had some cash. We paid cash for the alternator. We have no cash. We have really no money in the checking account, and so and we were able to pay for our tow, but not to get the car fixed. We, we walk to uh, the cars now at a dealer. This is New Year's Eve night at 4.30 in the evening. There's one man working at the uh, station and he happens to be a mechanic. We look up and there's a billboard and then it says, and uh, it was a church's billboard. So we call that telephone number and he's getting a haircut by his wife and he said he'd be right over. He has half of his head <laughs> shaved over here. The other half has his hair and it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. And they ended up, had us and he gave us cash to go to the hotel. The church paid for the car to get worked on. We ended up, uh, the, uh, the next day, we went to it and to their church. And this is now Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock. The guy's still working on our car. Right? No, New Year's Eve and at 7 o'clock. He's still working on our car. We go to in Calvary Chapel on, on Sunday morning. And I'll go ahead and use that church's name because they were a blessing to us. We had a car. We got to and worship with them. That day, the, the pastor asked for people and to, to share how God's fingerprints had been on their life and during this year. So we got to stand up and, and share. And then the pastor at the end of the service had his body come up and help this poor couple that's in seminary. And we've got a, a, a three-year-old boy and a five-year-old daughter. And people came up. My pockets were full. My children had $20 bills in their hand. And we ended up, everything that we had paid for in cash, we had more than that when we walked out on that Sunday. Talk about honoring one another, devoted to one another. Spiritual unity in 12:16. If you follow along, and verse 16, live in harmony with one another, with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people, and don't think you know it all. Tell you what, and that kind of unity, Paul uses two words and creates a whole new word: equal soul. Equal. It's different, but equal value and worth. Soul the true self and inner being. That spirit of unity is equal sold. That is what's happening. And to see what took place on Good Friday, a series of churches all come together and praise the Lord together at one place, not trying to steal from one another, but trying to go vertical to the Lord. That's an equal soul. That is a spirit, spiritual unity. Romans 13, 8. Loving one another. And that love is not like the previous love and that we looked at in 12. This is the agape love. 
and it's God's love. It's an obligation to love in the New Living Translation. It says, we owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. That is the agape love there. Romans 14, 13. Stop condemning. Another way to say it is stop judgment. 13, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble or to fall. And this is a legalism thing. Don't, don't lay any burdens on people that, and, that, and your own moral judgment. Let's try to find a way to stop judgment. Edifying, 1419. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Edifying is building each other up. <coughs> We're to add value to one another. Romans 15, I know I'm going fast, but we have so many. And Romans 15, 5, a spirit of un unity. This is complete in complete harmony. And here, um, may God who gives and this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other. It is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together in one voice, giving praise and glory to the God, our Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ accepted you so that God will be uh, given glory. So when we do this, we're giving God glory through it all. So we, that's also accept one another. That's a spiritual spirit of unity. A little further down in verse 14 of chapter 15. I'm fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. That you know these things so well that you can teach others about them. We're here to instruct one another. We're to warn, we're to admonish, we're to instruct, we're to impart understanding, we're to teach, we're to lay on the heart and the intellectual, uh, the intellect and the will of one another. We're to teach one another. Here's one that we've got to make sure that we do this one correctly. Otherwise, Moses might be doing more counseling or I will be. Or... And so over in chapter 16... 1616. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. And, <laughs> okay, now this isn't, I mean, we're not doing any tonsillectomies or anything like that. We're, okay, this is greet one another. Our culture doesn't do a whole lot of kissing, but where we work, we have people from 84 different countries, 84 students from 27 different countries, and all of our South Americans and a good deal of our, our Europeans all do the kiss thing, okay? Well, a little bit on each side. And so, and that kind of had to get used to that. When we lived in South Africa, it doesn't matter if you're walking male or female, two guys together. They always hold hands with one another. That was a little strange for me, okay, in walking a mile down the road with another guy. But that's how it be. There's a connection, okay? The whole idea is to greet one another and to know that you have a spiritual connection with your brother or sister, okay? So we may not do, since our culture doesn't do kissing that way, but we can at least greet one another with the handshake and we can develop our own handshakes or whatever. You can blow them up, whatever. That's our dynamite, whatever, okay? But just make sure that you don't get into somebody's bubble area there. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I, let me just, let's kind of wind down. Let's take a moment to, to process. I've given you a ton of information, but that's not what God wants. God wants transformation. Amen. Before you can transform though, oftentimes you have to know what it could be. And so you can then ask the Lord for that to be. I've given you his word. He wants to see that word lived out through you. He wants to see the one another's lived out at revolution. 
He wants to see us with a vertical relationship upward, inward, so he can fill us. So when we pray, we don't just do all the talking. We got to listen so he can fill us. And as we worship and he fills, we naturally will flow outward. God doesn't like lukewarm. God wants more. God wants more from revolution. He wants more from each one of us. He wants us to witness transformation in our own lives and in the lives of the body here. He wants to see death to life. He wants to see lukewarm to boiling hot. Amen. We sang soul on fire. That's a God thing because that was already picked before I preached this. He wants to see the soul on fire. So much so that we had to stop in the middle of the soul on fire because we had to cool the fire off just a little bit with the baptism. But then we came right back out and we continued back on fire again. Do you realize at 211 degrees, water's hot. One degree more, at 212 degrees, it's boiling. He wants to turn up the temperature at revolution. He wants to turn up the temperature in your heart, in your life. We're looking for 212 degrees. We don't just want hot water. Do you remember what he said about lukewarm water? He wants to vomit it out of his mouth. He'll spit it out. He wants you hot. From passive, filling up pews, to active, to living it out. So what does God desire? He wants a relationship with him. He wants a relationship with others. His love, his love in us so that people can see the difference so that the loss will write about us as Aristides did about the second century church. Leaders, you are to equip. The equipped, you are to serve and work. The workers are to build up. My question is, are you playing your role? Are you doing what God is calling you to do? A hundred plus one another's, 60 positive, 60 plus positive, 32 negative. So which are you doing? What should you stop doing? Remember, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you've got dynamite. Yeah. Yeah. Good. We're going to put up the last one and the well, you just think about those. I want you to hear my dream. And I wish I could speak as Dr. King did, or if I had like a James Earl Jones voice, but I don't. So hear this. I say to you, my, I say to you today, my friends, although we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's deeply rooted in the Bible and the church. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day Christ's body here, now on earth, we would realize that we are members of one another. Yes, we are all different, but all of us are a part of the same body. Once we have awakened to this fact, then and only then, we will be devoted to one another. I have a dream. I have a dream of unity for the church, that there will be a day where denominations and races will not be the divisions of the body, that the church will be of one mind and learn that though through accepting one another, that we will show Christ to those who look on. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day that the church will be known as an encourager, a place and a people that love and care for one another. 
enough to speak in love to correct and admonish a brother, and at the same time to see and appreciate the good of the individual. I have a dream. I have a dream that the day is coming soon here at Revolution Church that the atmosphere will be so filled with love that this will be known as a house of healing. Healing of spiritual hurts, healing of emotional hurts, healing of physical hurts that where we could confess our sins to one another, that we could wholeheartedly forgive one another, and that we would earnestly pray for one another. I have a dream. I have a dream that starting today, the love of Christ the servant will be the love that we show to the world by serving one another. That starting today, the love of Christ for the lost and the dying world would be the love and the compassion that we would have for our neighbor that we would be willing as Christ was, willing to leave heaven, to leave our comfort zones, to reach out to others whose eternity waits the truth which we know, the good news of Jesus Christ. I have a dream. I have a dream that now we would yield ourselves and that the Holy Spirit would so fill us with his power, would be a source of our energy to make this a reality. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this body. We ask, Lord, that as a body we would function and with total synergy from our little toe all the way up to our neck that we would and uh, that we would know that we are Christ's feet, we are Christ's hands, that we are in his arms, that you would use each and every one of us and in the world that you've placed us in. Father, that we would not just become a place of programs, but everything we do would be ministry. That there would be nothing of this world, but we would be timely. At the same time, Father God, we pray that we would always be timeless, standing on your word. Father God, that we would not act out of the flesh, that we would and do all of our ministry in the spirit. Father God, that you would be the one that would be glorified through our words, our actions, and our lives. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.